At the Congress today, I'm going to talk about how I believe the world has changed more in the, in the next 18 months, I believe it's going to change more than it has over the last 10 years. I think that this is no longer business as usual and brands need to react much, much faster. It's data's getting bigger, people can't make sense of customer information, executives are terrified, they're overwhelmed, they don't know what to do. So I'm going to try and talk about some of the stories like Sony and Uber and Microsoft about how do these businesses keep in touch with their customers to build better relationships faster. I keep on speaking English because the next speaker is English as well. And um, his name is Jeremy Waite. Did I pronounce that right? You did. Perfect. Makes me very happy. <laughs> Welcome on stage. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. And we're really looking forward to hearing about this amazing company. Big applause for Jeremy. Hey, everybody. I wouldn't applause yet. You don't know what I'm going to say. How are we doing? Um, wow, well, let me just talk for a second while people come and go. Um, it's really hard doing what we do, right? Um, there's not enough people that stand on stages. There's all of these fantastic entrepreneurs and, and people that have been around tech and digital for a long time that have done a lot of wonderful things. And sometimes they make it sound so easy. And I think we forget how difficult it is to do what we do, especially when you look at things like digital marketing and trying to connect with customers and stuff. It's, there's probably never been a better time to start a company. It's certainly never been easier. But um, what I'm going to try and talk about is why it's probably the hardest time in the world to build a company. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit. I also want to try and talk about how... Um, there's another thing that people don't talk about very often. We kind of look back and sometimes we act like it's business as usual. And we just think, how do we do the old things a little bit better? I'm a big believer that the next 18 months is probably going to change more than the last 10 years. So I'm going to try and make a case for that um, over the next 40 minutes or so. Hopefully, there's going to be some useful stuff. I'm also going to do something that I've never done before. This isn't the usual 365 slide Salesforce presentation to tell you everything that we do and how awesome we are. I'm going to try and talk to you about technology, the future of customer relationships, and where I think businesses are going to go next. So I've put all of the slides on SlideShare already. So, uh, and again, this is like the cardinal sin for presenters. You should never get people to check their phones at the beginning. Um, I talk fast and I might get excited because I'm really <laughs> super excited to share some of this stuff with you. Um, I'm going to show you some things I've not really presented before, so hopefully that's going to be interesting. But for those of you that may struggle with English or kind of business English a little bit, if you just check out slideshare.net slash Jeremy Waite, you can see the entire presentation right now. You can download it, you can keep the slides, you can have all the quotes. If you want to, feel free to follow along um, as well. I was head of strategy at Adobe. I used to work at Facebook valuing audiences back in the time when people were spending about half a million a day on advertising. You know, what was that page worth? What's the value of the like? What's the value of the interaction? Should you even put a value on a relationship? You know, we used to joke, what's the ROI of your dog? <laughs> or what's the ROI of your mum? As if, you know, there's some things that you just can't measure. And yet we try and put a number on everything in technology. So we'll get into all of that quite shortly, but I thought we'll try and look at the future. So because I'm doing that, I need to show you this, which is my favorite slide in the world. This is a love letter from my lawyer. Because Salesforce is a publicly traded company, I'm going to show you some technology that doesn't yet exist. I don't often get the privilege of doing that. So we're all friends. So I'm going to show you a video at the end of the presentation that we built with Bugatti. It's probably the greatest customer video you will ever see in your life. And I don't say that lightly. Um, lightly. Um, and also, I want to show you a new technology that's going to come out in a couple of months, the world's first social robots, a platform that you can build on. So because of that, if ever you buy stuff from us, which of course you will, because we're freaking awesome, um, make sure that you make those decisions based upon currently available technology. Um, and again, I don't just want to stand here saying Salesforce is awesome. It'd be really easy to try and do the whole kind of corporate thing. The only thing I do want to share with you for context is we've been voted the most innovative company in the world for the last few years and the most admired company in the world by Fortune and Forbes. That's not because of what we've done, that's because of what our customers have done with our platform. 
We're the fastest growing enterprise software company in the world at the moment. We're doing a lot of interesting stuff. Our CEO, Mark Benioff, my boss, has been voted the best CEO in the world. We're beating out Tesla and Twitter and Dropbox and Facebook and all of these great companies. So what is it that we're doing that's so interesting and why should you care? And is there anything in the middle of this that you might want to take back and speak to your customers about that might actually help you do things better? Whether you're trying to build a profitable relationship, a loyal relationship, a meaningful relationship, you know, how exactly can you use technology to do that? How could you have your business that's run from your phone? You don't need laptops, you don't need desktops, you don't need to go in the office. All the data that you need, instead of waiting 30 days to get backwards and forwards with agencies, you've got it in three seconds in your hand. I was with a company the other day that can do that, General Electric. They believe they've built a pipeline of $250 billion, $250 billion over the next five years, as a result of being able to look at their data in three seconds, instead of the 30 days it used to take them bouncing backwards and forwards with agencies. I was with one of the world's biggest automotive retailers a couple of days ago, speaking to their CIO. You know how many times they check their corporate data across the entire business? Twice a year. Um, we'll get into some car stuff later on. I'm writing a book about Uber at the moment. It's going to be the first book to be published about Uber. So I'm going to show you behind the scenes on some Uber technology as well, maybe some stuff that's not been shown before. But how do we do this? How do we join together sales, service, marketing, apps, analytics, communities, in a world where the majority of businesses never share their data between the departments, so you've got all of these silos, all of these different business units that don't talk to each other. They're sat on tons of customer data, and they have no idea what to do with it. Sometimes we spend all of our money trying to acquire new customers. We don't spend enough time trying to love and to keep ones we've already got even though in 2016 it's seven times cheaper to keep a customer than get a new one. And likewise, we don't have the same attitude to employees. Why don't we love our employees and we try and retain and keep the best talent? So how do we kind of tell stories and paint visions? How exactly do we do that? Because that's what I think our job is. If there's one challenge I have to you, maybe if there's just one thing that you take away from this, I don't care what your job title is, I don't care which part of the business you work in. Our only job is to tell better stories. The issue that we have is that the average attention span in 2016 is now down to five seconds. Five seconds, so we're telling stories in swipes, aren't we? Like Google talks about micro moments. So how do we tell our stories as fast and as compellingly as possible in order to build profitable, loyal, or meaningful relationships? This is just the marketing technology landscape. This is ridiculous, isn't it? 1,876 different vendors 43 categories, six different verticals. Every one of these, and you see this in the expo hall out there, everyone's using the same language. We're all saying the same thing. And you've got four out of five executives in 2016 completely overwhelmed and underprepared for their businesses' challenges, the stuff they're going to face over the next five years, because people don't know what to buy. They don't know what technology to plug in. They don't know what to measure. You see the language outside in the hall, and it's customer journeys, customer centricity, data science, big data, personalization, social at scale. Everyone says the same stuff. And yet we all know that every single technology company is completely different. They have different customers and different specializations. Kind of comes down to a big problem when everyone's trying to be all things to all people instead of focusing on the few things that they do well. So I was thinking as I was putting this presentation together, what advice could I give you? Is there a book I could recommend? Clay Christensen, if you've not read this book, it's fantastic. It's almost 20 years old. Clay is the guy from Harvard that coined the phrase disruptive innovation. He says disruptive innovation can hurt if you're not the one doing the disrupting. You should read The Innovator's Dilemma because it's an absolutely fantastic book. And it really talks about kind of the future of innovation and where it is we're going to, where we're coming from, and what are the problems in getting there. So in order to try and think about what that looks like, to set up some of the stuff for the rest of the day as you go out of here and you go back to your offices, we spend so much time looking forward, we don't often spend that much time looking back. So I want to do that just for a couple of moments as well. Because we forget that we came from a place in the 90s and early 2000s when the only thing we cared about was a one-to-one -one relationship. Like Google, we were doing AdWords and search. You remember when our click-through rates and our emails was obscene and we all got super excited to receive that email from Groupon. But you've got the one-to-one, -one, that transactional relationship that e-commerce retailers are so famous for. I'll give you a piece of content, you click, hopefully you buy, and then I can track it. 
really easy. But then everything changed. Web 2.0, social web, Facebook launched 2004. All of a sudden, it's not one-to-one -one relationships, it's one-to-many, isn't it? It's, I'm speaking not to you, but your 140 friends. And if they share something nice, they're going to share with their 140 friends. 19,600, they share again in a perfect world. 2.7 million people are going to see your one bit of content. So everyone got excited. We all ran around on Facebook trying to spend money, trying to build out all of these big audiences, even though we had no idea what they were worth. Um, the Angry Birds, I heard at one stage, was allegedly worth 122 million a year for their 23 million fans. And now you're looking at brands that have got millions of fans and say that it's not worth anything. It's not even a sales channel. Social media is a customer service channel, and you shouldn't ever sell on it. I think the truth lies somewhere in between, but we could definitely get into that in the Q&A. And really what's happened is where we are now in 2016, I like to think of it, we're in this place called systems of intelligence. 80% of all the traffic on the internet is now machines talking to each other. It's not people. It's Fitbits and Tesla dashboards, and it's all of your apps and it's our nests and our connected toothbrushes and our connected fridges and homes. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. It's getting super hard to try and make sense of all of this. And just like Julie was talking before about the buzzwords around data science, ultimately what we've got is not a data problem, it's a filter problem. There's so much data in the world, how do we make sense of it? You know, we look at cloud-based technologies to be fast. We look at how can we run our business from our phone? How can we be more social and connect with people at scale? do our customer service in seconds instead of minutes, hours, days, or maybe even weeks. And how do we get data scientists to try and make sense of that? That's a huge problem. If any of you have got kids, I highly recommend you teaching them to code. Send them off to code.org or code.dojo or something. There's going to be a shortfall of a million data scientists over the next four and a half years. There's just not enough people to make sense of all of this. So as businesses, we're trying to fight to make sense of the audiences that we've got. If you think, I don't know if this will work. Oh, maybe. Some friends of mine at Bristol University put together a little graphic. Instead of just giving you a slide that's got all the big data numbers on, I thought I'd show you instead. Thought it'd be more fun, a bit more interesting. Just because we can connect everything doesn't mean that we should. We can connect seagulls. We can connect cars. We can connect devices. We can connect anything we want. We're connecting our shoes. 90% of all the data in the world didn't exist 12 months ago. Isn't that amazing? 90%. And it's growing at a phenomenal rate. So apparently it's about two and a half quintillion bytes of data every single day, which for any mathematicians in the room, that's 18 zeros. That's a company the size of Google is now being created every two days. And it's going to get worse. The digital universe is going to be 40 times bigger by 2020. So our jobs is to use technology to try and figure out how we build relationships in a world where we need to filter everything out. You don't care that 20 million people are talking about your company every day. What you care about are the 500 that are going to buy something, or the 750 that are going to tell their friends, or the 250 that are so upset <laughs> about your service, they're going to leave, and they're going to tell all those other people along the way. And you know, How do you even predict? Crises, you put all your data in one place. Wadi Kamfar, great CEO, used to work for um, Al Jazeera News Network. He said CEOs used to be judged by how well they acted in a crisis. And today they're judged by how well they anticipate one. When you've got all the data at your fingertips, it makes it really easy to try and figure out what's next. It makes it really easy to try and make sense of all of this stuff um, in a world that, you know, that wouldn't have happened a few years ago, would it? This was Mobile World Congress a couple of weeks ago. Julie was just talking about Zuckerberg. Um, you know, we were all building on a Facebook platform a while ago. People used to go mental when he walked in a room, and now nobody cares. They've all got their headphones on and, and their Oculus and their gears. And just like Mark built out the platform in 2010, and there was a huge explosion in brands and content, we were all able to connect with all of our millions of customers faster. We can build companies like Outfittery super fast because technology now enables us to do that at scale. This isn't survival of the fittest anymore. Survival of the fastest, the small companies, can now use social to take on the big companies. Here's a great example of that. This is a startup that was founded on Indiegogo. Has anyone seen this before? Just show of hands, don't be shy. Has anybody seen Jibo before? No. 
Awesome. That's really exciting. This is going to come out in a few months' time. It's $499. It's $599 with an SDK kit. There's Salesforce developers building on this platform at the moment. I'm not an investor. It's not one of our companies. I just thought it'd be interesting to show you because this is the world's first social robot. The world's first social robot. As you watch this short video, it's about two minutes long, it's either going to freak you out or you're going to love it. <laughs> But when you watch it, watch it with your business head on as well. Think about what might this mean if this was customer service, or if this was someone giving you product information, or if this was someone at an event showing you the right place to go and you didn't want to ask stupid and keep asking things a million times. What might this mean when you've got access to so much information, we're creating so much value for our customers that we create more value than we capture? In business, especially in technology at the moment, it's the wrong way around. We capture more value than we create. We're so quick to get the click or the download or the newsletter sign up or the, the advert that they clicked on to go and do the thing. And we don't think enough about the experience, about how do we build a valuable relationship? How do we put ourselves at the heart of the places that really matter to our customers and their families? Watch this video and then we'll have a chat about it. This is your house. This is your car. This is your toothbrush. These are your things, but these are the things that matter. And somewhere in between is this guy. Introducing Jibo, the world's first family robot. Say hi, Jibo. Hi, Jibo. <laughs> Jibo helps everyone out throughout their day. He's the world's best cameraman. By intelligently tracking the action around him, he can independently take video and photos so that you can put down your camera and be a part of the scene. Jibo, take the picture. He's a hands-free helper. You can talk to him, and he'll talk to you back, so you don't have to skip a beat. Excuse me, Anne? Yes, Jibo. Melissa, just sent a reminder that she's picking you up in half an hour to go grocery shopping. Thanks, Jibo. He's an entertainer and educator. Through interactive applications, Jibo can teach. Let me in, or else I'll... Huh. And I'll... Huh. And I'll blow your house in! <laughs> hey, where'd you go? There you are. <laughs> He's the closest thing to a real-life teleportation device. He can turn and look at whoever you want with a simple tap of your finger. Check out my turkey dinner, Mom. I wish you wouldn't eat that. Hey. They make turkey pizza? I want turkey pizza. <laughs> and he's a platform, so his skills keep expanding. He'll be able to connect to your home. Welcome home, Eric. Hey, buddy. Can you order some takeout for me? Sure thing. Chinese, as usual? You know me so well. And even be a great wingman. You have a voice message from Ashley. Want to hear it? Absolutely. Hey, call me when you're home. Better make that takeoff for two, Jibo. We've dreamt of it for years, and now he's finally here. And he's not just an aluminum shell, nor is he just a three-axis motor system. He's not even just a connected device. He's one of the family. Jibo, this little bot of mine. What if technology actually treated you like a human being? Isn't that amazing? What if it's been built by, um, you can see the video, it's a little bit longer on the slideshow. Cynthia is the head of social robotics at MIT, and it's also been built by the guy, the VP of engineering from Netflix. So the guy that runs the algorithms, like the predictive intelligence that Julie was talking to you about, Outfittery. All of the things that figure out the movie recommendations. You've watched all of this stuff. We know all of these things about you. Therefore, how do we recommend for you to watch next? And they've built this platform. It's really, you know, you think about the best technology platforms in the world, and you look at things like Android, and you look at the Salesforce platform. You've got the biggest B2B app marketplace in the world. You look at the Facebook platform and all the wonderful apps that people have built on that. The next generation is like, what are people going to build on Jibo? or whatever is the next iteration of something like Jibo. How is that going to transform your business? The way that you can scale up, knowing that we can automate everything that much faster 
and then we can put the necessary filters in place to be able to figure out how to build relationships with our customers. And that's why I really wanted just to share this with you. I thought this might be interesting. I'm going to move on because I want to talk to you about stories and Uber. This is the biggest brands in the world as measured by Interbrand. Fantastic agency. They measure the intangibles of a brand. They measure what's going on in your head because, you know, brands aren't in control anymore. We all know our customers are in control now. So what Interbrand do is they measure that emotional component about what's going on through brand awareness across all the different channels and PR and brand awareness and preference and uplift. Not the commercial value, not the economic value. This is all about the stories. What happens when you think about Apple? You're in the pub later on talking to your friends about your iPhone. What exactly is that worth? Well, Interbrand puts a value on all of those. Great methodology if you're interested to have a look at it. Every September they measure the top 100. This is a whole bunch of them, this is the top 40. But there's a problem, it's a big problem. It's a big problem for us as we're here trying to build relationships with our customers. We're trying to get people to fall in love with our companies and our ideas and our startups. And according to Harvard, 77% of customers do not want a relationship with a brand. They actually go on to say that customers are not engaged. Um, so you could kind of argue about the definition of a relationship. But what does that mean? when customers don't want a relationship or an experience, or they don't want to think about you know, all the journeys we're trying to take them on. They're just like, just pick up the freaking phone when I call you. <laughs> reply to my email in six minutes, reply to my tweet in four minutes. When I go in store, yeah. how do we love our customers through service? We don't often do that enough, and often there's that disconnect, isn't it, between sales, service, and marketing. So I thought it would be interesting. Let's have a look at all the data over the last 15 years. So I pulled all the data from Interbrand. I built this. It took me uh, about 100 hours to put it together, which is ridiculous for one slide. But it just really tells a story about where our world has been in the last 15 years. You think back to the dot-com bubble. You remember, 98, 99, 2000, and then the dot-com burst. Bubble burst, about 85% of stock value was wiped off in about six weeks. Steve Jobs had just come back from Apple. Uh, in 1997, he came back as the CEO. Apple was three months away from bankruptcy. Remember that? Hard to believe now, isn't it? It was worth about five billion market cap, but it was three months away from bankruptcy. And you start seeing some of the biggest brands in the world and kind of how they've interacted over time. So that slide we looked at before, those systems of record, those one-to-one -one relationships, that's kind of what's happened up to 2004. And that's sort of, well, that was kind of like business as usual a little bit, but then, as we know, Facebook, you could argue Napster was the first social network, but Facebook changed everything. And all of a sudden, we have the social web. You know, Nokia kind of jumps on that. The iPhone gets launched in 2007. Google comes in in 2008. Now, this is interesting because my boss has got a great saying. He says, companies are no longer competing against each other. They're competing against speed. And yet, this is a brilliant example of companies competing against each other. Think about when Microsoft first started, and they built out the operating system and the office documents that they had. And Google built a search engine, and they never crossed over. They never competed at all. And the closer that they got together over the next few years, the more they started to compete. And now you've got Windows and Chrome and Surface and Nexus and Office Docs plus you know, Microsoft Office 365, et cetera, et cetera, Android and Windows and Nokia. You can go all the way down head to head. They took their eyes off the customers and they started trying to innovate on technology a little bit faster. And as we know, Apple came in 14 years to the day almost that Steve Jobs said it was. Now one of the top 10 biggest brands in the world. Doesn't take long to see what happens. Before this, Microsoft and Google were worth much more than Apple combined. Now, Apple is worth more than Google and Microsoft combined. It's shifted a little bit now, the alphabet and everything's restructured, so Google's now the biggest company. But this is disruption. You could see Toyota, you know, in 2008, they had a issue, an issue, a lawsuit, when they, they called it a sticky accelerator. There was a lawsuit. Did it get stuck in a map? They had to recall a load of cars. Impacting brand value because of one tiny incident. Amazon's just come in in 2015. Jeff Bezos says, I would rather stay focused on my customers and let all of our competitors stay focused on us. It'll be interesting, won't it, to see what this looks like next year with Uber, VW. Like, where's VW going to go after everything that's happened? So it kind of talks to a bigger problem. It talks about disruption. It talks about every business that we work for, especially all the traditional ones, how we're terrified that someone's going to come and eat our lunch. 
the last four boardrooms that I've been in, completely separate from each other. There was no, there was no separate meetings that joined them up, totally separate businesses. I heard almost word for word exactly the same thing from the chief executives. We do not want to be Ubered. <laughs> it's a phrase that I hear a lot now. And I, there was no agenda. I didn't kind of put those words in their mouth with what I was talking about. They were like, we need to figure out how to disrupt ourselves. We were talking about um, a case the other day of Blockbuster. There was a guy called Reed Hastings. He went into Blockbuster, took his Apollo 13 DVD back a little bit too late. About two and a half weeks too late. And they said, we're really sorry. You know, valued customer, we see you use a lot of stuff, but you know, a late fee is a late fee. It's $40. It's a pays late fee. He tried to argue it and he was so pissed. But you know, your Apollo 13 is late, so what can you do? He went out and founded Netflix. And we all know what Netflix did to Blockbuster. It's like, how do we make sure that that doesn't happen to our businesses? And we try and do that by putting values on everything. Values on relationships, values on clicks, values on every single app and every campaign that we do. We often use this phrase, and this is the chap that coined the phrase in the first place, W. Edwards Deming, one of the first management consultants of Ford. You can't manage what you don't measure. There's a better quote. And it's a little bit wordy, so I do apologize. I was nervous about whether or not I should show because of the screen. But this is what's much more interesting. This is Ed Catmull, who wrote um, Creative Inc., one of the best books that I read last year. Co-founder of Pixar, worked with Steve Jobs. He says, you can't manage what you don't measure is a maxim that is both believed by many and taught in the business and education sectors. But in fact, the phrase itself is ridiculous. Something said by people who are unaware of how much is hidden. In fact, a large portion of what we manage can't be measured. And not realizing this has unintended consequences. I find it fascinating now that some of the biggest tech brands in the world, like Airbnb, are using storytelling in exactly the same way that Walt Disney here, this is him mapping out Snow White, they're bringing in artists. Airbnb, you can Google this, it's a fantastic story. Airbnb brought in Pixar animators and storytellers to figure out how to tell their customer journeys. And just like Walt Disney here, what they weren't doing was trying to figure out how do we reduce the cost of technology, because obviously back then it cost a fortune, didn't it, to make all the cells and to draw all the pictures. That's not, although that's what everybody believed, that's not what Walt Disney did. What he's actually doing here is mapping out the entire journey of Snow White in order to figure out at what point do you fall in love with a character? What point do you cry? At what point are your kids going to get scared? What's the emotional component of how we get people to fall in love with the different things that they do with our companies, with the characters that they've got? Airbnbs using Pixar to help them do that. It's exactly the same thing we do in business. We just kind of, we underestimate that emotional component. This isn't about data. This isn't about click to buy. This isn't about creating compelling business models. This is how do we get people to fall in love with our companies? And the only way we can do that is by providing that valuable experience and understanding that every single step of the way, what's our customer going to do? When are they going to be emotional? We make decisions with our hearts and we justify them with our heads. And we often forget that. For, I'll just pick one example, Sony PlayStation. Sony PlayStation, what we do is through our platform and our network, we pull in all the transaction data that Sony PlayStation has access to, everyone that's ever bought from them, all their email and contact data, everything from mobile. We even take every single second of gameplay information from the PlayStation network, and we put all of that in one place in order to serve 120 million absolute unique customer journeys every single day. So that every time you get a message on whatever that device is, it's perfectly tailored for you. Technology can automate that. Obviously, you need storytellers behind the scenes to figure out what that piece of creative, what that component is, or what the offer is. But unless we have our sales, service, marketing, apps, and analytics, and all of our mobile properties joined up, it's impossible for us to do that. Google told me the other day, customers now cross at least five channels when making purchasing decisions. So if you're sat here today and you work in a mobile team or a social team and you have your little bubble, if you're not joining up customer data and the campaigns with all the other people across your business, you're never going to be able to do this. You're never going to be able to figure out the value of a customer. And if you don't know what your customer's worth, you don't know accurately how much to spend to get new ones or love and keep existing ones. It doesn't matter what's on this slide, but we never show this. 
This is what it actually takes to have a single view of a customer for a retail brand, especially when they've got a bricks and mortar store. We've spent 17 years and two days, actually, 17 and two days, Salesforce, um, building this platform, several billion dollars, in order to help brands have a single view of their customer across everything. And time and time again, I see the biggest mistake that brands make, and I'm not saying that Salesforce is the hub, that everything, you know, it's the one thing to rule them all. Obviously, you need open architecture, and you want to plug all of your other bits and pieces and data sets into it. But there needs to be a single view based around some kind of technology stack. And brands are all trying to solve it themselves by building out their own thing, and they're getting themselves into a mess. None of their data joins up. It's incredibly messy. So, is everyone okay? Kind of interesting, a little bit. I'm having fun. <laughs> I'd probably do this if you didn't turn up. <laughs> um, I think this kind of sums it up. You think about systems of record, systems of engagement, systems of intelligence. We talk about iteration, we talk about innovation, we talk about disruption. And we forget this, and especially in the Nordics. I spend a lot of time up here. And one of the biggest mistakes that we make is thinking this is business as usual. We think about things in terms of reaction. How do we just do the same things a little bit better? How do we optimize our direct mail? How do we try and optimize the email campaigns? How do we maximize the small amount we're spending on social? Or try and join up the online and offline customer to try and figure out exactly what they're worth. But that doesn't work anymore. This isn't about doing the old things a little bit better. This was about doing new things a bit better. That's when we talk about innovation. That's where real-time marketing, if you speak to all the analysts, Gartner and Forrester talked about real-time. That was the buzzword of a few years ago. How do we respond in seconds? And there's a second somebody gets in touch, we kind of have our big command centers. This is about how do we do a new thing a little bit better, but that's not where we're at in 2016. That's innovation. It's kind of like horizontal. How do we go vertical? How do we disrupt? And disruption is doing something new that makes the old thing obsolete. That's Uber, that's Airbnb, that's Tinder, that's Spotify. That's a completely new business model that turns everything else upside down. And we don't spend enough time talking about that. There's um, a phrase about personalization and personification. I just put it on a slide to remind you if you want to have a look at Because even if you just Googled the phrase personification, it'd be worth its weight in gold for you to understand that. Because we used to think this is about knowing thousands and thousands of things about our customers because they were willing to give us access to their information. And we know in 2016 that's not the case. People are so concerned about privacy. 75% of customer conversations are now on messaging apps. Snapchat, WeChat, WhatsApp, Sina Weibo, Facebook Messenger, Line. 75% of customer conversations are now invisible. A couple of years ago, as brands, we used to be able to see that. We'd buy command centers and we'd use all these social listening products to try and figure it out. Where have our customers gone and what have they said? We can't do that anymore. Personification is how do you serve the right message to the right person at the right time when you don't know their information. You don't know email, mobile, date of birth. You just need to know a few things about a lot of people and then look at those lookalike audiences. This is basically at the root of what Uber does. I'm going to share these slides with you for a couple of seconds. I think we have, we have 10 minutes. Awesome. Uber is the fastest growing company in the world. It's insane at the moment. They were founded in 2008 off the back of an idea in Paris, where Garrett Camp, Travis Kalanick, stuck in the middle of a really cold street corner just off the Champs Elysees after Le Web. They used to spend about $800 to get a limousine, and this year they didn't do one and they couldn't get back. It's the middle of the night, it's snowing, they're freezing cold. And they just said, wouldn't it be great if you just push a button? Car arrived in five minutes. That was it. They didn't do anything with it for about a year. They played around with a whole bunch of other ideas. 2009, they started putting some stuff together. 2010, the company was launched. It's been trading just over five years. Fastest growing company in the world. $62.5 billion. They're adding about 100,000 drivers every single month. It's just ridiculous. If you think about New York, you know those iconic Times Square photos. You've all been in New York and you've seen the yellow cars everywhere. It's 13,500 yellow cabs in New York, and it has been for about 50 years. You know how many Ubers there are now? 62,500. 50% of them work less than 10 hours, and there's some Lyft and some sidecar in there as well. But predominantly, this is Uber is completely changing the way 
that other people do business. It's interesting, we mentioned before politics. Um, Julie was talking about Obama. If there's one thing that tells you everything you need to know about Uber, it's that the guy that heads up strategy is a guy called David Pluff, P-L-O-U-F-F-E. He was a chief of staff for the White House. He got Obama elected in 2008, 2012. You've got essentially the best political strategist in the world heading up the biggest tech company in the world, certainly the fastest growing one. He's basically a real life Frank Underwood, right? House of Cards, that's, that's his job. How do we go in and battle? You could almost argue Uber's got litigation built into its business model. It's not just about people and products, it's about the political aspects as well. But they're doing a lot of really interesting things. Peter Thiel, who was one of the co-founders of PayPal, first outside investor in Facebook, he thinks it's a pretty sketchy company. It's like it's the most ethically challenged company in the world. Morally deep, but ethically grey. They look like they want to do something good, but really they're a little bit sketchy. But then you've got Bill Gurley from Benchmark, again, another fantastic VC from the Valley. He was one of the first investors in Snapchat and Twitter. He says it's the most important company ever created. One of the reasons he talks about that is because the vision of Uber is actually to give you back the most valuable asset that you have, which is your time. You know, they want to make Uber cheaper than owning a car, and they're well on the way to doing that. We'll have a look at some evidence of that in just a second. But they're completely changing the way that people think about car ownership. This, just like the interbrand slide we saw before, is an auto brand framework from Forrester. They measure trust and awareness and resonance of the brand and share a voice. And they measure all the biggest car brands in the world. Toyota's been at the top for a while. At CES, just before Christmas, the chief executive Toyota said, we're going to reinvent ourselves as a software company. He said, I see a time, maybe even 10 years away, where Toyota doesn't make cars, we'll make domestic robots. You've already got the biggest manufacturing businesses in the world turning their business models upside down. Why? Because of Uber. Uber's going to appear on this report next year for probably the first time. I don't have an inside story or a heads up. But they don't own anything. They own no cars. They own no employees. And yet they've brought down the cost of taking a car, just moving people from A to B, so efficient that we're going to see a time in the not-too-distant future where people don't own cars anymore. There's... Um, I'm trying to think if I can tell you the country. I can't. There's a country at the moment who are considering banning private cars very, very soon, making it illegal to actually own a car because it's going to be cheaper to have driverless and on-demand services. You know, the world's thinking in a completely different way. Why should we care? Well, we've got things like New York. We've got black cabs in London. We've got yellow cabs in San Francisco. We've got traditional businesses, just like we have in our own companies and our own industries. Is Uber really, you know... Is it really going to disrupt things that much? Is it not just a toy? Is it kind of a passing phase and people are going to get wise? Probably not, because in January the 26th this year, they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. It's one of the first taxi companies to go bankrupt as a direct result of Uber. And one of the reasons is because Uber just works so well. This is a view that you never get to see. This is called God view. It's kind of controversial. Um, the, this, the technology behind it is actually quite simple. All that's happening here is the Salesforce platform is helping to take all the data from every car and every mobile phone, all the different journeys. So what you can see is where the cars are going, the GPS data in the phones, people that even push the app but don't actually book a car, and all the people that are waiting for a car that are little icons with their hands up. And this is figuring out all the different analytics in order for Uber to figure out within 15 minutes how do we predict where the demand is going to be so that when you push a button, you get a car in five minutes. And they can overlay this with weather patterns and sporting events and rush hour and all kinds of interesting stuff. And that predictive element is what's helping Uber to be so efficient. They call themselves a lifestyle and logistics company. I don't know if this is going to work. I'm going to try something. I was sat speaking to the team at Uber. They have a whole bunch of data scientists. Interesting, you know, they've got political strategists heading up the company. The guys that are running are part of the sales and marketing and operations are managers from Goldman Sachs, just because they understand supply and demand. You know, they're not taking traditional marketing, sales, service, tech people. Think about things in a completely different way. They have two rocket scientists on staff, and they have a bunch of neuroscientists. Why on earth? <laughs> Why would a tech company have neuroscientists? Like, what on earth? So I was speaking to one of them, like, 
explain to me because I don't understand. Technology can do wonderful things. You don't need neurosciences. He said, I completely disagree. And his quote was beautiful. He said, we ask too much of technology and not enough of ourselves. He said, a neuroscientist's job is to make sense of the brain, how the brain talks to itself. And the brain is obviously a very, very complicated, incredibly noisy environment. How do we try and break down all the different things and the signals that are going on inside the brain in order to try and find a meaningful signal, some kind of signal in all of that noise? And he used this example, which I'm going to try and share with you now. It may work, it may not. We have this sentence, we've stripped out all the meaning. It's really annoying, it's really heavily distorted. Um, hopefully the speakers are going to work a little bit. I'm just going to play you this one sentence with all of the valuable data removed from it. So it's heavily distorted and a lot of white noise and stuff. I do apologize. Just see if you can make out any of the words. She writes to her brother every day. Anybody brave enough to shout out if they heard any of those words? Every day. Every day. Okay. Anybody get more than that? We only got every day. Okay. That's usually what happens. So this kind of worked. Listen to exactly the same sentence again with all the valuable data, all the valuable information put back in. Exactly the same thing, but cleaned up. She writes to her brother every day. She writes to her brother every day. Now listen to exactly the same thing that I just played you the first time. She writes to her brother every day. Isn't that amazing? You can hear all of it. The brain is so powerful at naturally being able to find a signal in all of that noise, but yet we rely on technology to do a lot of this. You know, like Salesforce, we have wonderful technology, but we don't ask enough of ourselves. So what was great when I was chatting to the guys at Uber about it is they showed me this. Now again, let's see if this works. This is a whole bunch of very interesting data. Can you see the screen okay? Okay, so that looks like a brain, doesn't it? That looks exactly like a brain network. Instead of looking at how the brain works, this is how a city works. How do people move around? And cars, and a very, very complicated, very, very noisy environment. What's going on around the outside is these are all the different cities that Uber's working in, the main cities. And you've got Seattle, San Francisco, you've got Boston, China, um, China. <laughs> Chicago, DC. And you can see the correlations, and it's really, really hard to try and make any sense of that. And the way that they operate is every single city operates as a separate startup. So they take all the data of which you know, Salesforce helps them to make sense of all of that, and they put that together. But what would normally happen, the way we would normally think about that is, this is all Seattle here. How does all of Seattle figure out those predictive models to know where our customers are going to go? If you're an e-commerce brand, how do you figure out to know exactly which message to send to which audience at 5 to 11 on a Thursday night? Because you know that's exactly when they're going to get the biggest click-throughs for the thing they're most interested in. You've got to understand these patterns. So what we do is we use filtering models, very clever algorithms, in order to figure out, for example, that, let's see what we've got here, Lower Queen Anne Square is linked with DC Glover Park. So there should be an algorithm now that matches those, whereas what they might have done in the past is use the central district to manage customer groups in exactly the same way. They go one stage further. They're even able to take all of the data. Let's see if this works. I thought this might be interesting to show you. This is all of the cars in San Francisco, where they started their journey, and then using probability and predictive modeling, they want to figure out exactly where that journey is going to end before anyone's even called or put the destination. So if I know exactly where the journey is going to end, I can use my predictive analytics to figure out where the cars are going to be, and now I can figure out you know, within minutes when someone pushes a button, they've got a car. It used to be five minutes in San Francisco. It's down now to less than two. Forgive me, this isn't an advert for Uber. I just think it's a great example in a way of a business using data to think completely differently. They've got models now that they understand for every $1,000 you earn more. In some cases, they think your expected response time for a car drops by three seconds. So you have two people calling a car. One person's earning $10,000 more than the other one. We know that person A is going to be willing to wait 30 seconds longer than person B, so we can start figuring out all the supply and demand. Now, imagine that you could do that across tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people, you know, without giving you the pitch for Salesforce. That's basically what we do. It's what we do for Sony 120 million times a day. It's what we do for Microsoft 400 million times a day for all the people that use the Office 365 network. 
across email, social, mobile, web, apps, analytics, communities. And basically, all we're doing is quite simple. All we're doing is taking an event, doesn't matter what it is, whether that's an email sign up, whether it's geolocation, whether it's something that you've signed up, a site that you've been on, some information you've given, customer service interaction. We put all the necessary filters in place, contextualize all of that, so you can just see the right message and you send it to the right person on the right device at exactly the right time. This isn't rocket science. People are going to talk to you about data science and they're going to sound really smart and they're going to pretend it's complicated and it's a buzzword and I guarantee if you ask a bunch of people outside, they'll maybe give you a very long explanation. They might talk about volume, velocity, variety, veracity. How much data? How many different types? Is it accurate? Where does it live? How fast is it moving? This is the only slide I believe that you need to know about big data or getting a single view of a customer in the same way that Airbnb has got or Sony or Microsoft. You're just going to take, this is really simple, this is it. And the reason it's beautiful is because it works in the back of a napkin like all good ideas do. Take all of your customer and contact data, everything from your CRM, employee data. Once you combine that with purchase data, you can now understand lifetime value. 37% of businesses don't know the lifetime value of their customers. So you connect your purchase data to your customer data. You combine that with the half a billion social networks, blogs, and forums. Bearing in mind, you remember we said 75% of customer conversations are now on messaging apps. We call it dark social. They're invisible. So once that conversation opens up with our brand, we need to measure that across mobile and all of our other channels. And we combine that with connected products like Jibo or like a PlayStation network or whatever. So that's kind of it. I promised I was going to end on a video. I'm 90 seconds over. I hope that's OK. This is the first video that we really created to try and show what happens when all this technology comes together. There's some custom engineering. It was for the fastest car in the world. This was a photograph just outside the Westbury in London. Um, this chap, by the way, I don't know if that's, you see this guy here? He has 2,000 pounds in his pocket. That discretionary money, if ever you go to London, you can like, see if he'll, if he'll admit it and own up to it. What they want to do is try and figure out if you had a bad experience in a hotel, they're allowed to give you like this blow your mind experience of like you ripped your dress or you got wet or something. He has the ability without asking his boss to give you money, you know, or to go and buy you a thing in order to try and give you the best experience. They're kind of trying to purchase loyalty, they're trying to buy your loyalty. Um, another thing from that Harvard report we saw before said there's no correlation whatsoever between blow your mind experiences and loyalty. And take your customers all you want to go and see F1 or to South by Southwest or some big gig or something somewhere, but no correlation. Loyalty is about customer service and understanding everything that your customer wants along every step of the way. So as I play this video for you, and we're just going to wrap up, again, just think for your own businesses what this might mean. What it might mean for your executives if they had all of your customer data, millions and millions of lines on your phone in one second. What it might mean for your stores when you know the second someone is about to walk in your store, what it is that they want. So you can create such a valuable experience when they're there and they don't feel like they're being sold to. This is the reason ad blockers are such a big deal because we're trying to interrupt everybody's conversation without context. So as we just watch this, have a think about what this technology might look like in your own business. The Bugatti customers are probably the most demanding and uh, sought after customers in the world. They expect from us since we build the the fastest car in the world that were groundbreaking in terms of our service, our reaction time, uh, and our uh, technological solutions. My name is Stefan Bruns. Uh, in the board of Bugatti, I take care of uh, marketing, sales, customer service, and Bugatti International. Digital has changed everything. It changed the face of how we do our business in marketing, in sales, in customer service, and even in public relations. In the 21st century, everything is connected. So we needed to create a platform that connects all Bugatti data sources, be it data from our car, be it data from marketing, or be it data from customer service. 
we created the Customer Company Command Center, a platform where everything connects. My vision is to run my business from this mobile device. On the road, I can monitor what's going on, but I can drill deeper in the analysis and get all the insights I need. I need my data on a dashboard, on a mobile device, so that I can follow up on the performance of the sales team, that I can follow up on leads or even forward opportunities um, to the responsible country manager. Here in Molsheim, we built, we designed the most individualized car in the world. For me, it's very important to know the customer, to understand what they really want, his tastes, his desires, and we create his uh, unique Bugatti experience. I send them renderings and to show them to get an idea how the car will look, and they're really excited. With the Bugatti app, it's so much easier for me now. Technology is a, is a crucial part for us uh, in order to fulfill our mission with Salesforce One, which we fully integrated in the sales process, I have all the data available I need. We are using a telemetric system in our cars. The flying doctor has the possibility to interact with the customer because of a technical problem. So in case that the tire pressure might be a bit too low, the responsible flying doctor can get in contact with the customer via the Bugatti app and inform him about not driving over 400 today, before he even knows that the car might have a problem. We send the customer updates almost every week to keep in touch with the customer during the whole production. And the customers really enjoy it. Imagine our customer arrives in London. We can send him a message right after he arrives at his hotel and ask him if he wants to visit our just opened Bugatti Lifestyle Boutique. In real time, that information is delivered to our Bugatti Boutique so the sales assistant can prepare for the preferences of our customers. So when the customer arrives at the store, he can feel at home in the Bugatti family. What impressed us the most on the Salesforce platform was the speed. At Bugatti, we have a passion for speed. And the Salesforce platform is almost as fast as our car. Very cute. One of the things that they found out was it used to take them 12 weeks to build campaigns. It now takes them 12 hours. You know, we've got to remember the goal in business is not to sell to people who need what we have. It's to work with people who believe what we believe. And if this has freaked you out a little bit, you know, that's kind of good because this isn't business as usual anymore. Gartner said something really positive. They said 2016 is going to be the year that traditional businesses fight back because they understand they've got more customer data, they've got bigger market footprints, and they've got more capital assets than anybody else, and we don't make enough sense of them. So what does that mean? Technology does amazing things. Technology is nothing. What's important is that we have faith in people, that they're basically smart, and if we give them wonderful tools, they're going to do something amazing with them, like some of the examples you've just seen. Thank you so much for your time. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Welcome. Jimmy, please have a seat here. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, I, however, am one of the guys who's afraid of the privacy thing. Thanks, the everybody. Whole, the whole um, notion of creating these databases. How much does companies, or does, does Salesforce have their own uh, uh, databases where they store information of everybody's out there, all the customers of your customers? No, that's, that's, that's not how it's supposed to work. That's not how it should ever work. Um, you know, a customer's data is always their own data. All we really do is I like to think that Salesforce is just a very thin technology layer. We're basically just a huge database with lots of APIs, and people can plug whatever they want into it, like you saw with Uber, like with Sony PlayStation. It's the customer's data, and then it's up to them to try and make sense of that for whatever application it is that they want. But really, we're just the platform that just connects everything. So we can help people run their business from their phone. We can help them connect in these new ways. In customer service, we can predict and help them to be smarter and more you know, predictive about their customers. We know what the problem is sometimes before the customer even comes to us. And like you saw with some of the customer journeys, ultimately what we're trying to do is just figure out what everybody does along each step of the way in a way that's respectful of their time and their privacy 
And obviously, you know, we're all very sensitive about our data and what so, brands do with it. So your customers' um, database structure of, of their customers, are they made in a way where they can be intrusive, or are you always trying to say you have to be respectful and how to treat this data? The way that they could be intrusive. Um, oh my gosh, that's a dangerous conversation. It's going to get me sacked. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think what it comes down to is it comes down to respect. I think it comes down to one of the biggest problems that we've had in marketing for a long time, which was we try and know a few things about our customer and then we start spamming them and we start sending emails yes. and you see brands just sending them irrelevant messages and people get pissed off. And it's why 77% of people don't want a relationship with a brand. Um, I think the bigger question is that there is a value that you can put on any piece of data. There always has been argue whether or not you should put a value in a data is completely separate because this is a relationship between me and you. Should I value what this is since we've got to know each other? Um, it's not transactional, we're just having fun. If we were sat in the bar and a brand came to barge in and interrupted our conversation, it'd be no different. And that's why that quote I said before I think is so important. Brands need to create more value than they capture. And often the way that they look at data is how do we capture data and then try and sell it. Or, or sell them something as soon as possible instead of, well, if I'm going to build a relationship with you, I need to get to know you. I need to trust you. And that's going to mean to start with, don't sell me stuff. Show me things that are valuable. Make me laugh. Educate me, inform me, challenge me, help me solve problems. We'll build a relationship so that when you do come to me with, oh, Jeremy, here's the thing, all of a sudden I'm interested because there's more context. That's what we're really trying to do. So with the brands that we have a lot of data and we help them manage, like Live Nation would be a great example. Live Nation knows 4,000 things on average about its customers. When you know 4,000 things about a customer, you can do a lot of interesting stuff to tell the right story at exactly the right time. E-commerce brands are no different. You know, don't send me the email at 11 o'clock in the morning on my computer. Send it at 5 to 12 at night on my tablet when I'm looking at such and such a thing. I should be able to know that. And that's what I think it comes down to about being respectful. We're running out of time, and I think everybody wants to go to eat. <laughs> I just have one question for you here. Um, um, and then I'm going to give you the right envelope, because we give this money for, to you that has been given to a cancer foundation for youth. It's called Ung Cancer. And um, I didn't know that there was actually a specific name on each one, so they fi find it for you. That was the one I should have given the last one. <laughs> so there is actually a risk that yours is already given away. Um, but while I'm looking for that, I'll ask you one more last question. You said before it's no value anymore to have a, a one million people in your database as a relationship. There's nothing you can do to profit on that. Is that really so? Um, no, I don't know if I said that. I think, I think really what this comes down to is getting the data is not the problem. Um, of all the data that customers have got, in some instances, less than 1% of the data that they have is measured or valuable or analyzed. Um, it's what you do with that information. The biggest challenge I see with some of the bigger companies is how do you value and filter out the data you've already got and put it into a format that makes sense? Yeah. You know, how do you use technology to take all of those millions of lines of unstructured data so that you have got a single view of your customer across sales, service, marketing, where in the past, you know, we're still talking about silos. We should have stopped that conversation years ago. And yet the biggest companies in the world are still struggling with this. You know, the, the biggest customers that we have, you know, when we still go and speak to them, even when all of this is in one place, even when they do know the value of their customers, they're still saying, what's your number one priority? Understanding my customers better. And it still comes down to trying, how do we take all of that? And I think that's the thing for you guys, right? I reckon we're going to look back in 5, 10, 15 years' time, and we're going to be completely blown away because I think we underestimate the world that we live in at the moment. We don't realize how fast things are changing. And it's like, damn, do you remember what happened in 2015, 2016? Um, but at the moment, it just feels normal. It's just getting faster and faster and faster. But we live in, in the most incredible time. In, in 1996, I think I was the first in the world to describe the internet with an exponential curve. Okay. And I've been increase, incredibly disappointed over how slow it's, the development's been because I predicted things to have happened a long time ago. Sure. Then it came, you could say the same about driverless cars. That should go super quick, but it won't. It'll no. take a while. And, and it came to me the other couple of weeks ago that you know, an exponential curve is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. Mm. Nothing happens in the beginning. But now, now it's going to be incredibly fast over Crazy, the next couple of months. 
Great having you here. Here's Pleasure. the money for the Council Foundation. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you. You're welcome. And um, big applause. Thank you, everybody.